Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We begin uh, lecture 30 uh, with a brief review of uh, what we had talked in the last class, uh, namely uh, the sixth order scheme of Lele that was obtained by uh, Taylor series analysis. Um, however, we also pointed out that there must be some basis for choosing a compact scheme. One way of uh, doing it was a optimization of the scheme by looking at the truncation error as uh, we talked about uh, in the last class about Haras and Tassan's method of looking at it in the k space uh, instead of worrying about um, the physical plane uh, matching term by term. And in the process we can develop uh, very accurate schemes, but whose order could be very less. That uh, naturally brings us to this uh, discussion on uh, uh, the distinction between order of approximation versus the resolution of the scheme. And we will surely uh, highlight that what is more important is uh, the resolution of the scheme rather than formal order of approximation. And in the process, uh, we also figure out why compact schemes are so accurate as compared to other uh, methods because of its uh, global nature. And that global nature can be uh, found out very clearly by an analysis that we have developed the spectral analysis tool. We can uh, figure out that uh, this implicit method when written and as an equivalent uh, explicit scheme that is uh, equivalent to 20th or higher order accurate scheme. So, this is uh, one of the plus points of compact schemes uh, as an, uh, a global approximation and um, we have uh, further developed the spectral uh, analysis tool by finding out the resolution uh, at any node for a non-periodic problem in terms of a projection operator. That is what we are going to talk about. And once we uh, do that, uh, taking the derivative is uh, equivalent to converting the k, the wave number into an equivalent k, uh, which we have called as k eq, which will have uh, now uh, a real and imaginary part the real path actually represents the phase, while the imaginary part represents dissipation or anti diffusion. This is rather important, because we just uh, will show using one of the older scheme due to Adams, that uh, near the boundary this scheme actually shows a very large dissipation near the outflow and instability near the inflow. <coughs> Then we will also talk about uh, Carpenter's scheme of fourth order accuracy and uh, we noticed that uh, this method also has a problem with the boundary closure. So, this uh, is uh, essentially due to the asymmetry of all compact schemes. So, we have to be extremely careful in uh, how we uh, get this uh, boundary stencil in the compact scheme. And this is uh, uh, this has led to uh, upwind compact scheme, which we will be talking about. But uh, uh, we'll uh, in the meanwhile talk about uh, evaluating second derivative as a, a sequence of uh, two first derivative operation. And with this, we'll conclude uh, lecture 30. We were uh, looking at. Um, uh, high accuracy methods of computing and in that context we were talking about uh, compact schemes. Compact schemes uh, typical example is given here uh, in equation 9, where the derivatives uh, determined by this uh, prime quantities on the left hand side are related to the function on the right hand side. You can see that these, uh, these are implicit methods, because uh, the derivatives that we are looking for, they are coupled in this equation. Uh, as opposed to explicit methods that we have done before. Uh, <coughs> so, there are some constants alpha on the left hand side, a and b on the right hand side. 
h is the spacing between the nodes uh, and then uh, what you can do is uh, you can uh, equate the coefficients of Taylor series on both sides and when you equate uh, the coefficients of u prime on the left hand side of course, you note uh, it gives you 1 plus 2 alpha and on the right hand side it is a plus b. <coughs> the next uh, coefficient was uh, the third derivative uh, terms coefficients and on the left hand side you get it uh, uh, alpha and on the right hand side uh, you get a plus uh, 4 b by 6 and so on so forth. So, what happens is uh, this three coefficients uh, are found out uh, uh, by solving let us say this three equations 10 to 12 and that is how you get uh, three values of this constants and this is uh, what we uh, usually uh, would get. These are unique uh, set of uh, values of constants for this particular case. And since you have satisfied uh, this uh, Taylor series expansion 9 uh, up to uh, fifth derivative, so next uh, drop term is the seventh derivative, that is why we called it a sixth order scheme. And uh, I emphasize the fact that uh, uh, you would uh, always be satisfying equation 10, and that is uh, the coefficient of u prime, because that is what you are trying to find out. So, since you are uh, looking for u prime, there is no way you can forget uh, equation 10. The satisfaction of 10 is a must and this is what we call as a consistency condition and this was a unique uh, scheme uh, given here alpha a and b. <coughs> and uh, we talked about uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, the leading translation error is the seventh derivative term that is why it is called sixth order scheme. We talked about Lele's effort in uh, trying to develop a fourth order scheme. Uh, fourth order scheme means uh, you would have satisfied 10 and 11 and uh, omitted 12 and that would uh, give you two equations and three unknowns. So, you get uh, one parameter family scheme. Uh, Let us uh, take alpha be that parameter, then you can get uh, A and B in terms of uh, alpha. <coughs> okay. So, we did talk about uh, this and we said that uh, Look, this uh, uh, coefficients that we are seeing, they are all real numbers. Uh, however, they are to be a sort of a tenuum in the sense they are not like um, Dirac functions that only at the chosen value you have uh, defined and everywhere the error is degraded. Uh, that is the question that uh, we uh, posed here that they are not uh, whether they are discontinuous function or continuous function and uh, we did. Uh, come later uh, and uh, discuss furthermore saying that uh, they are indeed continuous functions and uh, that opens up possibility of uh, obtaining optimized schemes. <coughs> you can optimize it, that is what Haras and Tassan did. Uh, they did uh, optimize uh, the scheme for evaluating the first derivative by minimizing the error committed by this uh, approach with respect to the spectral method and uh, uh, they tried to look at uh, the full range of k uh, for the wave equation only and uh, that was somewhat different than what Lele tried to do earlier. He also tried uh, his hand at optimization, but uh, because there were three equations, three unknowns, so he uh, looked at the departure at three values of k and from there he obtained the values. Okay. And uh, Lele observed uh, is the core of this uh, subject that uh, if you take a look at this uh, optimized uh, or non-optimized uh, uh, implicit schemes, they are far more accurate than their counterpart in the explicit scheme and uh, this uh, could be quite significant uh, that for example, a fourth order scheme that Lele obtained was outperforming a tenth order explicit scheme. So, basically that uh, made us observe that. Uh, we uh, really should not be bothered too much about uh, looking at the truncation error. Instead, uh, we should try to find out in the k space what is happening to error. That is uh, the whole uh, uh, <coughs> rule of this game. So, basically uh, we define what we call as the resolution. So, resolution is of course, what we are after. We are not uh, worried too much about order of approximation. 
and resolution means that how well you are resolving all length scale in the problem. Okay. Um, you may have uh, noticed uh, that we have already talked about the Nyquist uh, criteria, the chosen grade. That is one uh, criteria, but uh, the resolution is not the Nyquist criteria. It is something lower than that, and that's what we need to uh, figure out. And uh, we uh, basically would do that by looking at uh, uh, spectral analysis uh, in the case space, and that's what uh, we did subsequently. This is where you uh, begin uh, by expressing the unknown, let's say at the jth node, uh, in terms of its Fourier Laplace transform. <coughs> Please understand that this is the integral, this is not a series, so this implies that you are able to take care of uh, non-periodic uh, uh, problem, you are not necessarily solving a periodic problem. And uh, if you uh, recall that uh, in uh, this general framework, what we are doing, we are uh, looking at a linear algebraic equation where the derivatives, let us say the first derivative is obtained by solving uh, this linear algebraic equation. Okay. Uh, most of the time you would note that this A and B matrices are going to be constant uh, valued uh, matrices. So, uh, <clears throat> they do not depend on at what level of uh, computation stage you are in. So, you can do that. So, what you can do is you can uh, write it down instead of like this, uh, u prime should be equal to c u, where c is a inverse b. But please uh, pay attention that in your actual computation, you would never do this, this a inverse operation. Uh, what you uh, just now noticed that a matrix, uh, as you can see from this uh, equation on 9, would be the tridiagonal matrix, right. Uh, even then, you would not be doing A inverse uh, B. That is just for the sake of analysis, we are writing A inverse B. In the actual case, you will be always solving this equation, because this will involve. Uh, so, this is a uh, tridiagonal matrix here. <coughs> this is, this could be at the most a pentagonal matrix. Uh, what you would notice that uh, when you write down like this, u prime equal to A inverse uh, B into U, uh, what will be the bandwidth of the matrix? This is interesting, because you see here you are solving the equation. Of course, on the right hand side, you do not have to worry about whether it is pentadiagonal or heptadiagonal, because your function values will be given. So, you will be uh, make up this product and it will be just a vector, right. So, this will be a vector that you would be computing and then you will be solving a tridiagonal matrix equation. That is the whole approach that you would be taking. Uh, <coughs> so, if I know the dimension, uh, the rank of this matrix is n, then uh, we do 5n to uh, 7n calculations, right, uh, in solving this equation. And if you do A inverse B, what do you think the bandwidth C matrix would be? Well, um, if you uh, go ahead and perform that, you would be surprised to see that um, C matrix will have non-zero entries about the diagonal, which spans about uh, 10, 11 points on either side. Uh, what does that mean? It means that uh, C matrix is something like uh, a banded matrix. 22 non zero elements. So, that would be something like your 22nd order or 23rd order scheme, equivalent scheme, right. We did discuss it in the last class also that say, for example, a second order scheme we require 3 points, the middle point and the neighbors, right. The fourth order we need 5 points. So, if I have say 22 points, uh, the band width of C matrix is 22, then I am actually equivalently writing out about, let us say, a 23rd order scheme. So, this is the um, clinching uh, issue of uh, compact scheme that although you are solving a tridiagonal system, you are developing an equivalent explicit scheme which is of the order of 20 plus. It is a uh, significant advantage that you should have. And this uh, is the prime mover for this uh, whole activity. 
Now, you also notice that uh, if we are looking at explicit scheme, what is A? A is going to be an identity matrix, because we are explicitly finding the derivative at one point in terms of the function values. So, A will be just simply nothing but an identity matrix. So, that is what we said. So, basically what we are trying to do, we are trying to develop a framework where we can analyze a scheme. It is not necessarily has to be finite difference, finite volume or finite element. All you need to do is come to, to this level A and B. Time permitting, I will just uh, uh, tell you how to construct finite element method in this uh, whatever little time we would have. And there we would note that this A and B matrix once again are going to be some constant valued uh, matrices. So, this framework that we are setting up is going to be uh, rather generic and you could uh, use it for any uh, discretization scheme that you would like to. Okay. So, uh, one thing uh, that uh, we did talk about is this uh, bandwidth which we are now familiar. Uh, that uh, C is not necessarily band limited uh, by the bandwidth of A and B. Uh, so, this is a major issue that uh, I uh, emphasize again that compact scheme uh, appears local in nature, because if you are looking at j point on the left hand side, you have at the most j plus 1 and j minus 1. So, that makes it local, right. However, um, because of this uh, A inverse B operation makes the C matrix uh, bandwidth rather large. So, that makes it a basically a global uh, approximation and this is what we call as a global near spectral approximation. It is so good now, uh, let me tell you the compact uh, schemes are so much more uh, handy and accurate that uh, so called spectral element method, a offshoot of finite element method that is often used by many people. Uh, although they call it a spectral element, but they do use uh, Lagrange interpolation functions of the order of uh, 3, 4 or 5 at the most, there the accuracy is uh, that much, whereas this uh, provides you with a much, much uh, greater accuracy and much more uh, flexibility in solving problems. Okay? So, what we are uh, essentially saying in the last uh, bullet is that uh, if we are looking at any uh, generic uh, compact scheme, we can construct an equivalent explicit scheme. Right? That is uh, the connection between an implicit and an explicit scheme. <coughs> okay. So, for example, say you are trying to uh, obtain the first derivative as we have uh, seen here. Um, first derivative is equivalent to multiplying the uh, Fourier loss amplitude u of k by simply i i k. Okay. <coughs> and then, uh, let us say if we are uh, trying to uh, evaluate, I think there is a mistake, uh, uh, this, this thing should be ul prime, ul prime. So, what we are uh, trying to do is, we are trying to find out the derivative at the lth node. So, if I uh, want to write this, what I should be writing here, i k uh, u of k uh, e to the power i k x l d k, right. This is uh, the spectral uh, representation of uh, this. <coughs> However, uh, what we are doing here, we are writing it like this. So, what we are doing, in a sense, uh, a priori we do not know how many of those uh, uh, functions are involved. So, we would assume that B is full. So, that means, uh, we are taking the contribution from each and every node. So, what happens is, uh, we could uh, project this, uh, uh, let us say, uh, I, 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 I could uh, project it at any other point, say, I, I could write it right e to the power i k and then e to the power i k, I will write x l minus k. So, this quantity if I call this as some projection of uh, the jth node onto the lth node. So, that is what we, are, we have written here in equation 17. So, although my derivative is on the left hand side is relates to the lth point, whereas I am uh, evaluating the phase 
at the jth node, all the jth nodes. And then what will happen is, uh, if I just look at one particular point x j, then I need to multiply by this projection operator, that is what we have written here. Okay? <clears throat> so, you can uh, see with a uniformly spaced point, that will be simply nothing but uh, i k h times l minus j and that uh, basically uh, is further split into a real part and the imaginary part real I call it as R L J and plus I iota into R L J. Now, uh, so if I uh, like to write the derivative at say jth node, I can uh, write it here uh, because on the right hand side uh, we have a contribution coming from all the other nodes. Uh, nonetheless, what we try to do, we try to write an equivalent form, where the phase is essentially written at the jth node. You have to understand that whenever we do this uh, the derivative operation, these are local operation, means I am trying to find out derivative at the lth node, my phase is dictated upon by this quantity evaluated at the lth point itself. Whereas, numerically what we try to do, numerically we try to <coughs> uh, add up all the points contribution in the domain, right. That is what this right hand side implies, that I am not, if I am trying to find out the jth point, this is not necessarily at the jth point, but this is from u 1 to u n. All the points are coming into picture and that is what we are trying to uh, state here, that I have a sort of a global operation in numerical sense. But if we were to find out what is happening in the corresponding uh, theoretical spectral uh, explanation uh, 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 mode, then I should uh, look at this. Because now what has happened here, this is like uh, u j prime on the left hand side and this is my C matrix and this is my, uh, let, let me write this. So, what is this? Uh, C matrix is, suppose I want to find out u j prime, what I would do? I would take the jth row and multiply by the whole column, right. So, that is precisely what we have done here, that is what you are seeing here. I have taken the jth uh, row and I have multiplied, I have done that phase shift business. I project each and every point to the jth point. Uh, u 1 has been projected to uh, u j by having this and so on and so forth. So, that is why this quantities within brace uh, tells you how the uh, projection has been taken with the help of the C matrix. C matrix is also again a constant coefficient matrix. So, you, you do not have to worry about uh, anything, these are easily obtainable. Okay? <clears throat> so, having uh, obtained this, now what happens if this is my uh, spectral representation? What we have uh, done in a computational sense, we would have done it like this. Instead of i k, we would have obtained some i k equivalent. We know now how to calculate i k equivalent. I will show you here also. Uh, and then I would have multiplied by u of k. Uh, and then uh, ideally, I would have liked to be, uh, be getting it at the lth node itself, but I am uh, doing it like i k h, uh, if I am doing it l, uh, l minus g. So, this is what we are getting. This is what we want, right. So, what happens is, if I uh, look at this, uh, so, every u j or u l has been projected to the jth point and that projection operation is given here, right. This is what you are getting, this, this is the projection and then of course, you brought uh, the phase back to the jth node, that is what we are looking at. So, this is uh, essentially then the quantity within that brace is nothing but your i k equivalent, right. That is your i k equivalent. So, i k equivalent is nothing but your uh, c j l into p l j and that you have to sum over 
all the nodes L equal L running from 1 to L. <coughs> so, that is what uh, I said that you could uh, write your I k equivalent at the jth node in terms of the jth row of the C matrix multiplying by that projection operator T L j. <coughs> okay. So, this is uh, the story that uh, you can now calculate k equivalent and uh, remember this is uh, something that we have achieved now. We have been able to find out this k equivalent at all the nodes simultaneously. Right? It is not a local analysis, it is now a global analysis because all the nodes L equal to 1 to N are involved in evaluating that k equivalent at the jth node. Okay. So, this is something that uh, we did and uh, tell you what uh, this was not very uh, old story, this we did over here itself only few years ago. One of uh, our B tech student uh, uh, Gaurav Ganeri, he joined me in doing this and before that this did not exist. So, uh, in a sense I think uh, we did develop a, a spectral matrix uh, analysis, stability analysis over the whole domain. This is important because um, local analysis is good, but in the long run what you need to know is how you are solving the problem in the full domain and you would know how each uh, alteration at one point can affect the other points. So, this is what we need to do. <coughs> now, the second point that you need to notice that uh, this k equivalent that you are obtaining uh, is essentially a complex number right? uh, with the real path the real part be giving you what. So, here also I would be writing here some k equivalent. Okay. <coughs> so, if I now write that uh, uh, k equivalent to consist of uh, a real part Then what happens is of course, uh, if I am looking at uh, I k equivalent, so this part is going to give me the phase part, right? That, that you can easily see the real part actually contributes uh, uh, to the phase. However, this what does the imaginary part do? Look at uh, the I iota sitting outside and there is one inside. So, this will give us something like e to the power minus k imaginary into x. So, whenever you would estimate this k equivalent, the real part would tell you how well the phase has been represented, while the imaginary part will tell you if you have added numerical dissipation. See that is why we have been uh, discussing so far about central schemes. We do not want to needlessly bring in numerical dissipation, because chances are there that uh, will cause the solution to attenuate unphysically. So, to avoid that, what we are doing, uh, we are looking at central scheme, but suppose we have also, also seen that even though we are dealing with the central scheme, that near the boundary we still have to close the system. We said that we will have to bring in near boundary stencil, which will only get information from inside the domain. So, on the left hand side it will come from inside, that will go from right to left and on the other side you would get it from inside towards outside. So, we have talked about it. So, those boundary closure, the closing the boundary points would still bring us to one sided schemes. And as you know I have seen that if I uh, have this A and B matrix, which are not perfectly central, because the first row or the last row will have to change, because of lack of information from outside the domain, we will have to keep one sided dom analysis. And then what happens is, <coughs> you will uh, get a C matrix, which will not be symmetric, which will uh, be uh, no, non-symmetric and that in turn will give you a k equivalent, which will have an imaginary part. Why? Because you have seen that k equivalent comes from the C matrix here, right? C matrix. If the C matrix is uh, non-symmetric, then you can be rest assured that uh, will be uh, non-symmetric and you will have a imaginary path and that can add to numerical dissipation. And if you are not careful with 
uh, happened uh, to most of the people uh, before we stepped in. Uh, we found that, that many of the schemes, those are being uh, popular and used, they have this instead of numerical dissipation, they are having just the opposite effect. They were actually making the flow unstable. The problem, uh, the signals were propagating uh, with the amplitude growing. That means, uh, k imaginary instead of uh, being uh, negative, were actually becoming uh, positive. I will explain again. Please do understand that, um, well, l l let me explain uh, with the help of an example to understand this role of real and imaginary part. This would be useful. Suppose, let us take our uh, simple example here. If I am trying to solve this equation, now if I add numerical dissipation, then what do I do? I would add some, I, I do not know, let me call this new. See, if uh, nu is going to be a positive quantity, then of course, you are dissipating the solution, right? This is like adding a physical dissipation. So, if I have uh, a method where instead of solving this equation, I have an equivalent equation of this kind, what am I doing? I am actually adding a dissipative term only when nu is positive. If nu is uh, uh, negative, the way we are doing here, then we will be actually instead of adding dissipation, we will be pumping in energy to the system, right. So, if, uh, so this is what I would call a dissipative method. So, uh, let me put this. Uh, instead, if I get this, like this, a strictly negative quantity, then what do I get? This will uh, be not dissipative, just the opposite of that. So, people have called it as anti-diffusive method. So, we are adding anti-diffusion. Okay. <clears throat> so, if I now uh, go back and look at uh, the methodologies uh, we are talking about here. Yeah, look at equation 22. Now, if I have uh, k equivalent like this, then what am I getting? k equivalent to of k, then e to the power i k equivalent x of j uh, d k. This is, this is what? This is, let us say, we are finding out del u del x at uh, x j location. That is what we are finding out. Okay. Now, say k equivalent has a real and imaginary part itself. Uh, well, let me write it. This part, I am just uh, leaving it as it is. Now, uh, what happens? This I could write it as I k real uh, u of k e to the power i k equivalent x j d k and I uh, will get minus k imaginary u of k. Okay. So, now you see this equation, if you look at this equation here, what we are getting here is this del u del t plus this is this part. So, this is this part that is uh, c times this. And uh, this is additionally that has been brought in here. So, I could take it on the other side. 
then you can see the role of K imaginaries. So now you see, there is no iota here, like here there is i. So this is like your a second derivative brought in there. Now you can see what we are talking about. If k imaginary is uh, negative, then what will happen here? If it is positive, it will work as a diffusive term. But if it is negative, it will work as a anti-diffusive term. So this is something you have to realize that how important it is for one uh, to obtain this k equivalent and then uh, you would like to probably plot it in a non-dimensional form uh, by scaling it with respect to the corresponding theoretical estimate. So, that is why we will be plotting k equivalent by k and uh, of course, uh, by now you are comfortable with the idea that instead of plotting it across as a function of k, we will be plotting it as a function of kh. Okay. <clears throat> that will uh, make your job easier because all the time you will be plotting between 0 and pi. That is the universal limit right? set by Nyquist limit. So, <clears throat> uh, that is what uh, I just uh, restate here. The ratio uh, reflects efficiency of a method with respect to the best theoretical estimate that you can get uh, through the uh, spectral method. Okay. <clears throat> now, I uh, emphasized also this path that if you would uh, choose a symmetric stencil for the interior nodes, uh, that would uh, give rise to uh, k equivalent, which will not have the imaginary path and that would actually mean that you are developing a non-dissipative scheme. That is what the second bullet states. Hmm. However, uh, we have also seen that uh, we are forced to take uh, asymmetric stencil uh, for the boundary and near boundary point that uh, would make the method uh, either dissipative or non-dissipative near the boundaries. And this is an implicit uh, threat of uh, uh, compact schemes. Okay? So, we have to be wary of it and we have to uh, guard against it. Okay? <coughs> uh, we will have to figure it out and we have also seen that these are all matrix operation. So, even if I do something at say j equal to 1 or 2, its effect will percolate much more uh, deep inside the domain. So, this is uh, what it is. So, let us uh, look at some of the things which people have been doing. Uh, this was uh, taken from Nick Adams' uh, thesis work. He uh, suggested that uh, use a interior uh, stencil like this and as you can see, this is um, the, on the right hand side, we have a 5 point uh, molecule like what we have already stated. And this you can do it only from uh, 3 to n minus 2. So, you need to have uh, closures at j equal to 1 and j equal to 2 and as we uh, kept saying time and again, this will have to be one sided. So, at j equal to 1, it would be a uh, admixture of u 1 prime and u 2 prime on the left hand side and on the right hand side also, it has to be one sided. right? So, that is what is done here. You can convince yourself, you must do it yourself. Uh, do a Taylor series expansion and check what is the uh, sort of uh, order of this scheme. Okay? You would be uh, noticing that uh, you are uh, matching the first and third derivative. So, this is essentially a, a fourth derivative stencil that uh, fourth order stencil that you see in uh, 23. Same about this also for j equal to 2, you take a stencil. Uh, well, this is somewhat slightly better. On the left hand side, again, you have a symmetry though, 1 for 1 uh, and same thing about the right hand side also. You can see there is a anti-symmetry that is what you require, uh, 3 and 1, uh, both have uh, amplitude equal to 1. So, it is the point j equal to 1 that may uh, give rise to some problem. Uh, whereas, uh, rest of the point, you have a perfectly symmetric stencil on the left hand side that you see 1, 3, 1 and on the right hand side, you again get what you want in the anti-symmetric uh, coefficients. Right? j minus 2 is minus 1 and j plus 2 is plus 1, j minus 1 is minus 28 and j plus 1 is plus 28, uh, all are divided by 12 h. 
So, you can uh, see uh, that uh, again we can do a Taylor series expansion and you would probably note that uh, these are uh, six order accurate fields. Okay? So, basically Adams uh, started looking at uh, these uh, problems uh, using a six order interior stencil and fourth order boundary stencil. <coughs> What do you do? You have to do a similar thing at j equal to n minus 1 and j equal to n. Uh, j equal to n minus 1 would be nothing but a mirror image of 24. Okay? So, this will be u n, this will be u n minus 1 and this will be u n minus 2. Whereas, what will happen here? Please uh, note this that while on the left hand side the coefficients remain as they are, on the right hand side you are going to see a antisymmetry. So, you will uh, write it here uh, for 24, okay. uh, instead of uh, 3, we would be writing u n minus 2 and this will be u n, but in addition we must have a minus sign. You, you, you can convince yourself that uh, this would be just the antisymmetric uh, representation of the right hand side of 24. Okay. So, same thing uh, holds for uh, j equal to n that would be a mirror image of j equal to 1. Left hand side coefficients remain as they are. So, replace u n prime by u n prime and u 2 prime by u n minus 1 prime. And on the right hand side, you will be writing instead of minus 5 u 1, you will be writing plus 5 u n. Then instead of writing 4 u 2, you will be writing minus 4 u n minus 1 and then minus u n minus 2. Okay. So, this is the way you have the full A and B matrix set up for you. Okay? And all the time, whenever you need to calculate these derivatives, which are given on the left hand side, you will be solving this equation by trilateral matrix algorithm. Right? So, that is the uh, practicality of this issue. Okay? I, I think that is what we explained just there, that we have uh, near boundary point stencil, which are fourth order accurate, and the interior points are sixth order accurate, formal accuracy. And, uh, this is uh, one of the scheme that was used by Adams. Uh, there is this group from NASA Langley, Carpenter uh, and their group, they used uh, this uh, type of scheme. <coughs> and uh, what I just now said, I just um, uh, showing you here. So, what about this scheme 27? 27 is basically uh, something like what uh, Adams took actually for the interior, sorry uh, for 24. You see, Adams uh, took this uh, scheme, which is a fourth order accurate scheme, but it is symmetric, that is what I mentioned. So, in the Carpenter scheme, uh, the interior nodes are actually this, the same equation that Adams uh, did. Uh, this is for j equal to 2 to n minus 1. You can see they can be applied all the way up to 2 to uh, n minus 1. You need to only close the system by having a scheme for j equal to 1 and j equal to n. Okay. So, these two are uh, written here, these two are written here and uh, what I said about uh, how to write out uh, the anti-symmetric scheme, uh, 28 is just the anti-symmetry of uh, 26 on the right hand side that you can uh, see. Okay. <coughs> to compare with this uh, fourth order accurate uh, compact scheme, uh, Carpenter also looked at uh, explicit fourth order schemes and uh, this is uh, what is given here. And you see, when you go to explicit fourth order scheme yeah, on the right hand side in 31, you can see uh, you need uh, j minus 2 to j plus 2. So, you can uh, write it uh, for 3 to n minus 2. So, even though you are doing uh, explicit method, uh, your work actually increases because you have to have two more additional closure schemes for j equal to 1 and j equal to 2. Okay. And they are also written like this and uh, I suppose this um, uh, 29 and 30, they are also formally fourth order accurate. <coughs> so, the whole idea in this exercise by Carpenter uh, and his colleagues were to compare a fourth order explicit versus fourth order implicit scheme. I will show you the result. Now, I think uh, maybe I should first show you the result, then we will come back here again. So, if I look at uh, fourth order implicit scheme. Uh, what we have uh, here is um, on this side we have plotted k equivalent by k and on this side we have plotted uh, k h and you can see uh, we have taken a uh, 
domain from j equal to 1 to let us say 31 and we are showing half the number of parts because it is perfectly symmetric. So, if you see only one half you can imagine what is happening on the other half because they will be coincident on the real part. So, the left hand side is the real part of k equivalent by k and ideally you would want it to be equal to 1 to as large a range of k h as possible right. That is what we want because uh, in a spectral method that remains 1 all the way up to k h equal to pi and then it falls off at the Nyquist limit. So, we would like to do that, but in this compact schemes you would notice uh, they do remain 1 uh, to a pretty uh, large extent and then they start falling off and this is what we call uh, a filtering of the solution. You see this is what you may have done, I do not know if any of you have uh, taken this course on electrical engineering, they talk about filtering low pass, high pass filter. Well, you may have you have seen how those filters work. So, you can tune the filter and selectively attenuate or amplify different frequency band. So, it is also the same way here instead of time domain we are looking at in space and instead of looking at frequency we are looking at wave number that is the only essential difference, but other ideas are exactly same. So, what you see that compact schemes or any discrete scheme has this attribute as we have plotted. We have seen that uh, they have this attitude uh, approach to make this uh, k equivalent way k go to 0 at uh, phi. We have done it, we have done it if we have looked at uh, C D 2 and C D 4 expansion uh, in the previous path, this is what happens. However, you notice one uh, very interesting thing about this, uh, at j equal to 1 that is the uh, inflow part of the domain, uh, look at this it has a very, very exaggerated overshoot. What does it mean? That um, some of those intermediate uh, wave numbers are weighted more than they would have been even for a spectral method. Whether this um, overemphasizing some k component is good or not, we will talk about it later, we will not appreciate it now, but we do agree that this is not physical. Physically, it should have been 1 and then it should have fallen to 0. And this departure overshoot is uh, significantly more than this uh, filtering attribute of uh, any discrete scheme. <coughs> now, you also look at uh, the imaginary part that is shown here and we have plotted k equivalent by k imaginary part versus k h and uh, what you notice that j equal to 1 line actually uh, goes off to a exceedingly high value and uh, this positive values I think uh, here we have uh, taken a uh, sign inbuilt into it. So, that is why all this uh, positive values imply numerical instability. So, what it actually tells you, what it actually tells you that uh, in the process of spatial discretization itself, if you are not careful instead of uh, dissipating the solution, you actually are going to pump in energy and that uh, would be quite catastrophic. As you can see, you try to use this and try to solve even this equation, which uh, uh, is what you are going to do as your next assignment. I suppose you will get an hands on experience in analyzing schemes and calibrating it with respect to a standard uh, problem like this and you would be able to see what uh, this is uh, doing. So, the first point is uh, very badly behaved as we can see here, uh, uh, this goes off to a value of k equivalent by k is 5 times, this is uh, uh, exceedingly high value. But the same thing happens with uh, other nodes also, j equal to 2, 3 and so on and so forth. What you are seeing, that is what I mentioned uh, a moment ago that um, although you are making a mistake at j equal to 1, taking a wrongly directional stencil, that effect is percolating inside. You are seeing that its effect is felt at j equal to 2, 3 uh, all, all the way and only when you are substantially inside, then you see it becoming what you want it to be. It is a symmetric scheme. So, you want the imaginary part to be 0 and that is what you are seeing only near the, uh, well, uh, I would say j equal to maybe 13, 14 that is what you are getting. 
even this value here, I think 5 or 6, they are unstable very clearly. You would also see that uh, some of these things are very uh, interesting that it goes up and down. So, it shows you that uh, instabilities are very selective in a, across a small uh, uh, range of k. So, you have to uh, do that. So, this was what you see for the implicit scheme and you can see the k equivalent by k here is equal to 1 all the way up to about 1, right. Uh, well, it is even more than that, it is about uh, 1.2 or something. Now, if you look at the corresponding explicit scheme, uh, you can see what you are getting. The real path is on top and you can see it uh, falls off uh, from a value of about 0.6 or so. So, although you are having both uh, the methods at fourth order schemes, but uh, explicit scheme allows you to maintain accuracy only up to 0 0.5, 0 0.6, uh, whereas the implicit scheme allows you to go to twice the range, right. So, what, what does it mean? That if you are solving a problem, uh, you should be able to do accurate calculation by taking half the number of points, if you are adopting the implicit scheme as compared to the explicit scheme. So, if you have let us say a three dimensional problem, in each direction you get a benefit of this kind, a factor of two reduction. So, you are actually going to get by with uh, maybe about half the number of points in each direction, that amounts to about 8 to 10 times benefit, right. So, uh, in fact, I will uh, come to some schemes which uh, we have developed here itself. Uh, we get such benefit in each direction by a factor of 8 to 10 and you can understand that can translate into uh, benefit of the order of 500 to 1000 times and that is what we have been doing for last 10 years using PC to compute problems which others use supercomputers to do. So, it is possible. So, we have exploited uh, the benefit of implicit schemes. Uh, so, let us uh, go back. Uh, uh, so, this is what we talked about. Now, let us uh, talk about another aspect. We have been talking about uh, the first derivative, right. First derivative we are evaluating uh, by solving this equation or we are doing this u prime equal to c u. Now, suppose I want to evaluate the second derivative, then what I could do? I could uh, equate the second derivative with the first derivative, right. This equation is that. That if I write this, so if I use this in here, I am going to get So, basically uh, we are uh, doing it twice to get the second derivative. Now, what does it do? That is what uh, we try to uh, understand and we tried to do in the initial stages when we were at it. We tried to evaluate the second derivative by this equation 32 and what you are noticing here is uh, that this has been done in two steps. First, you uh, solve a prime a u prime equal to b u and then you again solve it again a u double prime equal to b u prime. So, that is what is implied by equation 32 here. Okay. Then, uh, let us say simplify the problem very much. We take that uh, say some sort of a stencil which we had shown here. Uh, given here, this is a uh, Adam scheme. So, we uh, take uh, n equal to 5. So, what we do is uh, j equal to 1, we use this equation, j equal to 2, we use this, j equal to 3, we use 25 and for j equal to 4, we write out an expression which is similar to 24 and for j equal to 5, we write out an equivalent expression of 23. So, if we do this, then it is a nice C matrix is going to be nice 5 by 5 matrix. And then uh, I suppose some of you may be familiar, you can use the symbolic manipulator, right. Maple or MATLAB toolbox also has it, Maxima is another one. So, you can use the symbolic manipulator and you can work out this uh, C square matrix. 
see all those schemes that I talked about the Adam scheme, the interior stencil was sixth order accurate, the boundary closure schemes were fourth order accurate and we used that a combination of a fourth and sixth order and we worked out the second derivative analytically using the symbolic manipulator. And you can see what this is, this is your CD2 expression. So, uh, what happens to our uh, obsession with order of accuracy? We used a fourth order and sixth order and this is an exact operation, symbolic manipulator comes back and tells you that in effect you are doing actually second order accuracy. So, this is a clear uh, evidence that um, worrying too much about the order of accuracy is not really something that we uh, like to do. Okay? <clears throat> so, that is uh, the last comment that I uh, made there. Now, if I uh, go back to that Adam scheme and uh, let me also tell you that uh, uh, the previous example also tells you that sometimes doing this analysis over unrealistically small number of points uh, can give you such surprises. See here this could be an attribute of uh, taking only 5 points. Suppose I would have taken 8 points or 10 points, I would probably get something different. right? So, please do not uh, over generalize. I think this is comes as a warning for your uh, exam question. You always saw a quadratic and you saw the product term is minus 1, all of you jumped the gun and said ok, the product is 1, so 1 is more than 1 and is less than 1. That is not true you have all forgotten that both of them could be equal to 1 and that is exactly what happens with leaf frog method. So, if you would have just done it, you would have some of you have done it, you have seen it. So, please do not generalize. right? So, this is what, uh, uh, what we also seen that we tried to see the sensitivity with n and uh, done this exercise with the Adam scheme with uh, 20 points and 30 points and when we saw there is absolutely no difference between uh, the two sets of results. then go back and adopt one of them. So, we have uh, uh, if at all we have erred on the uh, conservative side, all the results that you see are going to be with uh, 30 points at least. So, if you take any more number of points, these are going to be not uh, different. And this global analysis uh, tells you uh, how this k equivalent by k, the real part varies with k h for different nodes. Once again, you can see this first node is always ill behaved, but this is somewhat much better than what Carpenter's method was. Uh, you saw the overshoot there reaching up to 3.5 and 4, here it has gone up to uh, less than uh, 2.5. And uh, we will talk about uh, the role of j equal to 1 and j equal to n somewhat uh, later, but let us uh, first uh, look at this result. So, they do, uh, do not look too bad, you see. <coughs> In the interior, you have a sixth order scheme and that is why you will see that k equivalent by k remains flat all the way up to 1.5, the value is 1. So, it, it, it shows you that out of the full Nyquist limit, you are able to get almost half the range. Okay? Uh, I think uh, this is uh, instructive because what we are going to do? The spectral methods are always used using uniform spacing. You cannot use uh, spectral method using non-uniform spacing, whereas this compact scheme we can use it after mapping your governing equation to the transform plane and in the transform plane you have equispaced uh, nodes, there you can use this. So, this makes it uh, somewhat uh, of a utility that we will uh, see as we uh, go along. Okay? 